recording button. First, I apologize if a few people were in the waiting room for a little bit. Um, it's a little notification box that that missed while Lori was presenting. But if you missed um, a little bit, you can catch it on the recording after today, we'll put it here. So I'll cover the USAS major updates from the beginning of December, which was release 8.9 through the end of March, which was 8.17. And you can find more details by clicking on these links. We did have, oh, and then the 2020 is located below. So you can find the December releases there as well. There were um, like 1099 changes in December, but since that season is completed and it will be most likely changed by next year, I'm just gonna show you um, some of the other highlights of the December release, which included the, the file archive calendar year report tab. Again, this was implemented at the end of December on version 8.10. This sent the calendar year financial reports to this tab, whereas in the past it was under the December tab. So now when we go to the calendar year reports tab and click on the row, you can see what's populated in the bundle. If I had a database with process 1099s, I could also see the 1099 tape file here my XML printing file. And if I submitted as a district, um, if I submitted the file to the IRS, I would have my transmitter report under the calendar year report archive tab as well. So I'm gonna start on the core menu and talk about the updates um, with that. In February on the 8.15 release, we implemented what we called in classic Venload. So this new feature will allow users to import a CSV file to add or modify vendor data. And to do this, I'm first gonna show you the, um, the formatting and the criteria as well as the template that we provided in the documentation. So by going under core vendor, vendors, you can see import vendors, vendor import criteria. We uh, put what was required on your file and the formats that are acceptable like for the dates and all the, the formats. Just a note that the ACH Fields are included on the template, which I forgot to show you. It's right here. It's included on the template, but it's not included in the software as of yet. So we made a note here, and that would be the ACH active, the bank account number, the routing number, the type, and the entry class code. So I'm going to pull up my spreadsheet and demonstrate this. I populated my vendors um, with different formats of active, uh, social security, EIN. Everything that you would normally see on the vendor screen would be in here. The 1099 address check or PO address. If you have a different location for a purchase order or 1099 or check, you would designate it, see this is exam depot. I have a different address for the purchase order than I do set for the check. And I would just, like your vendor screen, you would just put true or false. So I'm gonna take this file, go back to the instance and import it by using this button. 
I did want to also point out that I left oops, these blank so it'll auto populate my vendor number. I choose my file. And then once I load, it'll give you an informational box of, how, of the results. So I have three records loaded, one error. And then I got a file that when, you, when the user opens it up, it'll give you the, the error message to let you know what you need to fix. So if I go over here to the end, you can see that it says no default, default PO address is defined. And I purposely left those, that blank on the cafe, the lights, so that I would get that error to show you. So I would just eliminate that, put my fields in, resave it, and then um, go back and import it. I'm just going to change it. That's my file. Click load. And now I get zero error errors. And if I go to my vendor screen, you can see the art museum, school books, exam depot. Let me open up the exam depot because that was the one that had the different addresses. And you can see that populated as well. So that's kind of nice. Another new feature um, would be on the transaction menu. This was at the end of January in the 8.13 release. And this was the ability, the ability to import accounts payable invoices using the CVS file. So again, for your convenience, under the transaction menu, you go to AP invoices, you can see the import criteria below, the formatting, the required fields that are required. And again, I have a spreadsheet that I'll pull up. I have my invoice populated here and you notice it's the same purchase order and it has five lines. Um, the required fields, according to the documentation, would be the invoice number, the purchase order number, item number, vendor number, amount, and status. So I'm setting that purchase order to full with a date. I think I said that the from here on over is required, and these are optional, but I did choose to populate some of them. And I will take that file, go back to the instance, import it and demonstrate that. I'm sorry, I looked at my notes. I, for these that are not populated, it'll default to the current date. And that would just be for the date of the invoice, not the vendor invoice date. So that one was on that purchase order, so we'll just, Sure you remember. Choose the file. And it's similar to the other. I have one record loaded, two errors. So if I look at the file, You can see that when I didn't have that date that I pointed out populated, it defaulted to the current date, but obviously I don't have a posting period set up, so it, it wouldn't um, populate. So if I, as a user, if I just would 
update my oops, spreadsheet. I'm just going to call it Pat again. Click load. And this time they were successfully added. And if I go to the accounts payable AP grid, They should be there. Two, one, six. That. This one is right here, the two, one, six, one, oh, one. Any questions on that? All right, so Lori showed you, and I got a snapshot of the void and unvoid. This is what it looked like on the USP side, USPS side. So once the user on that side clicks that post to USAS, I wanted to show you what it looked like on our side. And here you see two files, a payment unvoid and a payment void. Now the payment void file is like the classics auto post void file. And by posting this, when you edit, you the user only has three choices, validate, reject, or post. And when you post it, It will create a receipt with a description, payroll payment such and such voided by, and I'm the admin on the date. So there's the file that we posted. The receipt will contain a, uh, the reduction of expenditure for the account that was on the voided payroll payment. And if we go back to the pending transaction, and look at the unvoid, if I posted that, this will create a disbursement with the type of payroll indicating the date of the file. So there's my payroll file that came over. And then of course, if it's rejected, it'll go back to the USPS side to correct and resubmit. Another new feature on the transaction menu would be the ability to repair a purchase order. And this was to replicate some of the verify invoice or VERIMV -E options in Classic. So as you, and you can use this as long as there are no payments or disbursements against the purchase order. And if there are no payments, then you can change the account on the purchase order charge. Actually, I'm gonna pull up a specific one. By viewing it, you can see this repair button. Once you click on it, you can um, update the account number that is on a purchase order charge. You can update the vendor. And this would also include updating any invoices that may be sitting in payables. Because if the invoice is sitting in payables, it's not technically paid yet. So that is a nice feature. And then date, you can change the date. 
this function does follow the posting period rules. So if the district chooses to implement the rule not to have the ability to reopen the closed posting period, then the PO repair cannot be used. So the advantage of using the purchase order repair versus editing of purchase order is the purchase order repair will also update any unpaid invoices. So you can see Barrett's sign is here. It hasn't been paid, but it has been invoiced. And I'm gonna change that to uh, neon signs. So let's go back to the purchase order grid. And that purchase order. Prepare its sign. View the purchase order. Click on the repair tab. Click on the vendor tab. And this is a feature or a tip that can be used throughout the software, but I know I wanna look for neon. So if I put it in between perc uh, percent signs, it'll pull up my neon signs. Click update. You'll get any warnings. But you also get a result here, which you can print the result as well. which looks like this is your result file. So it shows the vendor from Barrett's to Neon and the purchase order, the invoice and any payables. And if you go to the payables, you will also see that it changed Neon signs. You can also change the account on a purchase order or PO repair. Here, it'll give you the, this is only a one line purchase order, but say if there was 20 and 20 different account numbers, then you would have 20 different options to drop down. I only have one and then the account number that you would uh, populate. Another tip that I often use in the software is using the TI with a slash. So since I'm looking for a, uh, an expenditure account, I would use the 02001. It just helps populate the, the accounts I find faster, I don't know. So there's the account from this account to that account. Click on update. Click on that and then update. And you get your normal remaining balance warnings. You can also print that result. And that's what that looks like from this account to that account. The easiest update to repair a purchase order is the date, because all you have is the one field to update it. Click update. So that's really nice. And again, it's so we went from January to the beginning of February. Again, if there, a purchase order is not, has been paid on, then this can't be used. This, I guess I look at it like there's sometimes when you're entering purchase orders or recs, converting to purchase orders, and it's like the end of the month, you might have, or you're posting a January 31st uh, purchase order, but it is actually February 3rd and the system defaults to the third and you want to re, you know, 
he'll repair that to where you wanted it in the first place, which was January 31st. So that's an example of like real live example. Any questions on that so far? On the budgeting menu, we have a chat. Would the PO repair work for an account if that line item wasn't paid on? It would, as long as that line wasn't paid on or the purchase order wasn't paid on. Under the budgeting menu, we had just a, I guess I would call it an improvement. Under the proposed grids, it was, this field was a text field. So users would populate it with 2021 or in error they did 21 because we're used to thinking fiscal year 21. Well, that was creating an error. So we, the, the developers just made this a drop down. So that was minor, but nice. On the periodic menu, we had a lot of updates to the federal assistance summary and detail report. I am gonna go to the summary because as you know, you gotta have the summary record set up first before any of the details of the federal assistant detail record can be added. So notice that 2020 and 2019 are both grayed out. So those obviously have detail records attached to them, but 2021 does not. And that's because we're gonna create some. So on the February release 8.14, users now have the ability to clone detail records. So I'm gonna look for um, last year's and then the clone button. This is a drop down. The line number populates. You do wanna update the fields that are applicable, such as the grant title, if you have the fiscal year and the cash account. So that's cloning. Oh, and I wanted to show you that um, another update was on that same release was this last zero on the CFDA numbers for being um, dropped off in some occasions. So now that will, that will populate the whole CFDA number like it should. Also, there are tool tips. As you hover over the grant, now tool tips are informative and they can't contain clickable links. So in the documentation, we do have that. Let me go to the documentation. So under the federal assistance, down here is the link that you, the users can click on. So the tooltip will bring you, um, will let you know, and it can be accessed through the wiki. All right, so we updated. on the wrong one, didn't I? So here's the one that we cloned. I had updated the grant title and the cash account. I sh I'll show you the count filter option in a moment, but you did notice as soon as I picked the cash account, the federal contributions received and the federal expenditures spent were populated. And that was in the 8.15 release. So we just cloned one. 
I also want to show you to create one. Again, it's the drop down. The line number populates. I am going to create the IDEA grant. And pick my cash account. And those received amounts and expenditures populate. On the 8.5 release, these create new or close functions were added. So if you're setting up all your 2021 um, federal assistant records, detail records, you can click on create new. I'm just gonna close this when we're done. The only exception to these populating would be for any non 500 level cash accounts. So for instance, the food service 006 fund. And that is when the account filter is handy. So I'm going to close or save this record. You do have to have the account filter set up prior to adding your record. And just so you see it, I'm going to pull it up. I just set it for the 006 fund, my special cost center with read only access. So then when I do go to the detail record, Well, first, I am going to show you that you are able to, without using the account filter, oops, I just lost it. You can enter these two. But I think the um, account filter is handier. So, Go back to 2021. Sorry. I'm on the wrong example. I picked my cash account 006 with a special cost 0000. I enter my cat my account filter and choose it. And do you see those populated? So that's, not, that's the um, advantage of setting up the account filter for any non 500 fund cash accounts. This record um, is created, but if the amounts, like if additional revenues were added to the system or to the grant accounts or additional expenditures, this would need to be refreshed. And you would refresh those by, well, editing, repicking the cash account. saving it and it'll, it would, as soon as you repick this, it'll update your new numbers. Uh, we had an update to the revenues and expenditure reports in January on the 8.11 release. And this allowed users to run this report for other periods than the current period. If you leave it blank, it'll run for the current period, but you can specify a date and it works like the as of, so as of February, 2021. And you, as of the 8.14 release in February, this report now can also use the filter name.
So as I'm going left to right, I'm going to skip the rule and come right back to that in a moment to talk about those new balancing rules. But I am going to go to the accounts receivable module because that had some updates as well. In February 8.15, the payment location, well, as of that release, it now allows a user to edit the payment location without having to save it and then reopening it. It was like a minor correction, but it's been corrected. On the billing, Um, the due date, instead of it defaulting to the current system date when the billing is created, it will now calculate the due date value based on the billing date up here. There's my mouse right here. And any days till due that were entered and specified on the ledger account. As of 8.13 in January, we prevented users from using or from posting um, billings with a zero item. So if I, and I'm in March, so let me change this. So when I, if a user had a zero amount and posted, you will get an error. In classic, this was often being used as like a text field. They would enter their details and then enter a zero, go to the next line, finish the details and enter the amount for the billing. Whereas in redesign, you don't need that because we have um, the length of the field for the description there for you to use. Plus redesign doesn't support the zero items. These zero items were actually be causing issues on the grid. So now if users were previously removing the totals from the billing grid prior to this release, they should now be able to go back and add them back to the grid without having any issues. We also added the ability to email an accounts receivable bill to a customer. And once it is emailed, this box on the billing will be checked. But let me show you that. In order to use this, it's in order to use the AR billing function or to troubleshoot with districts, you're gonna have to have a, the customer is gonna, oops, Customer is gonna to have to have an email address. I got one entered. Under system modules, the email notification has to be enabled. Under configuration, and some of these are probably already um, marked, but the external notification must be enabled. And then the accounts receivable billing email setup is where you would enter the from email and the carbon copy email. So to do this, I'm gonna go back to the billing grid, pick the, this billing to be emailed. And as soon as I check it, my email button comes up click on that, I see my to and or my from and carbon copies, and I send it. It will give you a message that one email is sent or not. Um, if it fails, it will the error message will display why it failed. So that's handy. Once that's emailed, let me make that darker. You can see it's checked. And also, if you have that on your grid, it'll also populate that. That was for the 105. So now it indicates that it was truly emailed.
So the rules, um, let me show you the rules in the wiki. On the last release, 8.17, um, there were new balancing checking rules. However, you probably saw the SSTT notices about the rule not currently functioning as intended. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, these four rules are the new ones. The warning messages were implemented by default and the error messages were disabled by default. So let me show you what it was doing like on the budget. So this is that rule. You can see that the account had 30,000 encumbered and I, the user invoiced the full 30,000 and received this error. Now the wiki says the warning should indicate the fiscal year to date unencumbered balance, which is zero, any future encumbered or any requisitioned um, that would exceed the remaining balance of the account. So you can, the, the issue is this 30,000 was included in the error message because technically when you're invoicing, it's not paid. So that encumbrance is still here. So it's still taken it in consideration, but um, the developers are looking at it. Users are able to disable this by, um, by going to the, the rules and disabling it. Any questions on those rules? In today's release, um, the ability to use XREF codes in the receipt import process using a CSV file is gonna be implemented. That's gonna work similar to like our um, AP invoice import, but you'll be able to use the XREF codes that some districts or ESCs use. Coming soon is the ability to post purchase orders using the CSV file. And again, we'll have that, the formatting and criteria in the wiki, but it'll be similar. And then also coming soon um, is the appropriation resolution recap report, which is like the classics APRIS um, program. That is all I have for the USAS updates. Um, we do have some upcoming Fridays with fiscals that I have here that you can find on your on the meetings and trainings page. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, after today, you will find the link here to click to see the full presentation. We do appreciate you joining us today. Um, if you do think of another question after this, just send us a, a help desk ticket. Have a great weekend and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.